This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, cultural critic and film historian Peter Biskind discusses his book, Pandora's Box, how guts, guile, and greed appended TV. He looks at the changes in television over the past 40 years, from the networks to cable to streaming. He's interviewed by Wall Street Journal Media and Entertainment Bureau Chief Amol Sharma. Before we get to this week's episode, we want to take a minute to ask for your help. Your financial support will ensure that C-SPAN can continue to produce podcasts that inform you about national politics, introduce you to the latest nonfiction books, and provide valuable historical context to today's news. Make a donation today and be a part of C-SPAN's future. Visit c-span.org slash donate. Peter, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to speak to you today. Well, thank you for asking, inviting so you've written quite a bit over the years about about Hollywood, particularly the movie industry. This right. book uh, is a really wonderful tour of uh, modern television and how it evolved into uh, a medium for deep, provocative, original storytelling. We've all become familiar with this term that we're that we're living through the golden age of TV, with these shows like Mad Men and Breaking Bad and Succession, and the list goes on and on. What made you uh, want to tackle this subject now? And also, with so much ambition and sweep, this is a book that spans several decades. Well, um, basically, because, you know, movies have declined. You know, they've become, um, you know, they become uh, a monoculture of uh, superheroes, Uh, you know, basically through Marvel and somewhat through DC. Uh, And... There was. It just seemed to me that there was less and less um, interesting work being done in the movies, and a lot of the talent had uh, migrated to TV. I shouldn't say migrated. Stamp. It was more of a stampede to TV. So whereas uh, you know movies had been elevated by the so-called auteur theory into an art form in the um, in the seventies, uh, uh, but now the, now the whole story seemed to have flipped. In other words, it was TV that was the art form, and movies were, you know, sort of merely entertainment. So that's really the, uh, that's what prompted me to um, take take uh, take TV on. As far as the second part of the question goes, why several decades? There have been a lot of books on HBO, but HBO was only, you know, HBO was the pioneer of the so-called golden age of TV, but uh, it wasn't the whole story, and uh, other um, uh networks and producers carried on from HBO after HBO kind of slid a little bit in the uh, in the mid uh, 90s what when did you detect that shift that film was was no longer the auteur medium and it was television when did, when do you think that started or you saw the first hints of that shift oh gosh I don't know uh, it's like superhero movie after superhero movie yeah. it's hard it's hard to pin it down you know whether it was um, you know whether it was um, which one, you know which one it was Spider Man, uh, you, you know uh, Iron Man. I mean, some of them were good actually. Iron the Iron Man movies are pretty good, and sp- some of the Spider Man's movies were good. Like you know any genre, there are good ones and bad ones. But on the whole, it just got to be one after another after another, and there wasn't much else on. Uh, and uh, so that that's really what prompted my um, move to TV. You know, I want to go back for, back to the history again in a bit, but first I want to uh, f- ask you a question about the here and now. Um, so we we just saw in Hollywood uh, a pair of pretty bruising labor strikes by, by writers and actors. Um, that, that's been resolved, but there was a lot of fallout, a lot of uh, um, uh, Difficulty met by both sides for the for the talent certainly, and even you could argue for the companies going through this. You've got big players like Disney and Warner that are under a lot of financial pressure now, and there's this feeling in Hollywood that everyone's trimming costs, reining in production deals. It's it's a different environment. Are we? Was your book looking back at the golden age of TV? Are we still in it? Is it ending? Is it over? <laughs> Good question because. When I started the book, it was supposed to be a tribute or a celebration of this new golden age of TV. But now it's over the course of writing the book, um, uh, it became not so new anymore. And now uh, many, many people have pronounced the golden age of TV over. 
or peak TV dead. So it's, you know, the, uh, the writing about TV is full of obituaries for this period. So I try to, uh, you know, this, this change happened um, while I was writing it. And I tried to prepare for it. And I think I did, basically. And I have a very, uh, uh, I guess, you know, somewhat pessimistic or dark ending of the conclusion of the book, which tries to uh, guess what's going to happen in the future. And it's not a pretty picture, particularly. You know, I'm probably one of those people that said peak TV is over. So you can add me to that list of people that that's uh, that's that's claimed that. Um, you know, HBO, you mentioned, is a key. Uh, it's not the only actor and protagonist here, but you did start with HBO in this book. And most people now, especially if they're younger, they'll think of HBO and they'll think of Game of Thrones and they'll think of uh, Succession, The White Lotus, maybe Euphoria. Uh, but you start with a very different HBO. And uh, tell us a bit about what it was, this scrappy startup in the 70s and 80s. You, you spoke extensively to, to Michael Fuchs, the executive in charge at the time. Just what was it like? What was their business at the time uh, in the early going? Well, I mean, HB, the whole rationale for HBO, which was the first cable um, channel, uh, the networks had, the networks used, uh, the, the business model that the networks used was a sp- sponsor advertising model, which meant that um, it gave advertisers enormous power over content. They didn't want their products, you know, Cheerios and Buicks and whatever else they were advertising, aspirin, to be, to, uh, be adjacent to scenes of uh, sex violence and controversy. So they kind of imposed a, um, a bland, puritanical 50s era uh, uh, model on content. So even, you know, even married couples were not allowed to sleep in the same bed. They had to sleep in twin beds adjacent to each other. Um, so HBO came along uh, and it it uh, it uh, used a different, it used a subscriber model, not a uh, advertising model, which meant that subscribers freely chose to invite HBO into their home and the uh, hardware that um, enabled cable to, you know, cr- uh, spread across the country was privately owned. Therefore, the Federal Communications Commission uh, did not have any real jurisdiction over HBO, or and so HBO was allowed to do everything that uh, the networks weren't, namely sex, violence, and controversy, and it exploited all three of those things to the utmost. You know, the, it, when you... So, Sorry, yeah, okay, I mean, just one, one, one more thing. And HBO very consciously rejected the networks and they wouldn't hire anybody who um, who had worked at the networks because they, you know, they, they cultivated the so-called quote-unquote HBO way of thinking, which was anti-network. And it was, I see some parallels. I wonder if you agree between... HBO breaking into original programming. Remember, in the early going, it was a lot of it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was showing movies, old movies, was a big part of of, of what they did. And going into original programming was sort of a, a risk and a bet. And it felt very familiar to the Netflix story. Many, you know, decades later, where Netflix is showing you DVDs and then decides to go into original programming. There was, there is kind of. It seemed to me there's a real parallel in the risk and the that these outsiders trying to get into the inside Hollywood game at the time. Well, yeah, there, there, is, a par- there, there is a bit of parallelism involved uh, between early HBO and uh, early Netflix, but Netflix went in with, you know, off, you know, feet first, you know, they just jumped into it, whereas HBO was fairly cautious and uh, they didn't have the money uh, that Netflix had to begin with. So that's right. why they uh, relied heavily on um, you know, on, on uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, and, and they were, uh, you know, they were afraid to, you know, during Fuchs's period, they were reluctant to uh, get into original programming because as Fuchs said, uh, their viewership was, was used to Hollywood movies, which are highly polished, uh, uh, ex, you know, highly, you know, highly pro- professional, professionally executed 
shows and they were afraid that if they got into original programming uh, their sh- their original shows would appear uh, sloppy and unprofessional compared to the Hollywood movies they've been showing right yeah and you know the 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 history of of prestige TV or whatever you want to call it this this era of tr- great TV a lot of people started with the sopranos you you're careful here to note that you say it started with the show Oz, the prison show Oz, which was on HBO. Uh, what what was it about that show that was so groundbreaking that that made you focus on that as the starting point for everything? Well, I you know I think you have to go back to what Chris Albrecht was head of programming at that point, and I think you have to go back to what he told Tom Fontana, who was the showrunner of Oz. He said, "Don't worry about um, making your, char- your your characters likable, just as long as they're interesting." Uh, and relatable, they'll be relatable. And the other thing is, what 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 is uh, what's the biggest no no of any you know for any showrunner uh, on a new show, which is don't kill off your main character in the first scene of the first episode. Yeah. So uh, uh, Fontana proceeded to do exactly that. He had his main character, uh, the lead character, burned to death in the first episode of the first season. So he gave um, Fontana an enormous amount of leeway, uh, really unprecedented to do whatever he wanted. And Fontana took advantage of that and, you know, portrayed a really tough environment, which is, you know, inside of a prison. Uh, And I always use this example. One of the things that uh, he did right away was he showed an Aryan nation thug um, uh, burning a swastika into the um, uh, the butt, uh, the rear end of one of the other prisoners with a cigarette. You know, and that's pretty tough stuff. And so, nothing like that had ever appeared on network. And that pretty much paved the way for The Sopranos because after Oz, you could pretty much do anything. And it, it felt like this what this executive Chris Albrecht had said about you don't need them to be likable, just interesting, does seem to be a this this anti hero theme throughout television, whether it's Don Draper and Madman or or or, uh, or Walter White or all these big these characters of television that people have come to love. They're they're all flawed people that the audience is supposed to root for and that that really was not the norm at the time. You're very you're very clear in laying out. That's really the opposite of what network TV wanted. Yeah, I mean, network TV um, heroes were heroes. They acted like heroes. You know, cops were supposed to, you know, arrest people and bring them into fit. You know, to be uh, to, to to be just you know to face a just punishment. They're not supposed to kill people. You know, kill criminals or frame frame innocent men or women. Uh, beat them, you know, which is what happened uh, routinely on, um, you know, on on streaming, sh- you know, on cable and streaming shows. And it I was mean, also. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say the other thing that that stood out to me was the wire and uh, um, these all these shows that depicted institutions. I mean, you noted this in the book, the depiction of institutions on premium cable on HBO and then later on on these other cable networks. That were really high end. Uh, it was it was kind of more real and gritty, and uh, what was depicting America as it is, and not sort of in a in a, a lighter version of it that had been on network TV, whether it's the cops or the mob or prison. Um, that that seemed to be. Um, did that w- was that something that was really hard to convince television executives to go along with? Like we we want to really show you what the police is like. We want to really show you what the um, you know uh, what prison life is like that that seems to be you know have been a leap for a lot of these these companies. Well, that's true. I mean, when when uh, David Simon went to HBO to propose uh, The Wire, uh, he was immediately you know uh, met with a cold shoulder because HBO's attitude was, "What are we going to do a cop show when cop shows are all over the networks?" Okay. And Simon's attitude was. Well, the network cop shows um, uh, idolized uh, cops and demonized the poor, and he was going to rip, sort of rip the, uh, the, the, you know, pull the curtain over on what the police were really like, and 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 kind of rehabilitate the portrayal of the poor 
uh, and show them to some degree as victims of the police. So he was going to turn the tables on the network cop shows. And that was, you know, that instantly appealed to HBO. And that took quite a bit of research, right? I think you, you recount David Simon. Was it was it that he embedded with the police or he did he did some like firsthand reporting to really understand what he was talking about, right? Well, he was a journalist, for one thing, for um, yep. the local in Baltimore, and uh, he knew a lot about the police. And then he, you know, he befriended a, a uh, one of the cops who became his, his uh, collaborator, and he also went on ride-alongs with cops. A lot of these people who went on, who wrote about cops went on ride-alongs, and they would find that you know uh, they couldn't use the material that were, they were they were confronted with on network because it was too grim and too <laughs> you know to you know behavior of everybody the cops and the uh the you know the the criminals were both you know were, were just too wild for network whereas uh they were perfect perfect for cable yeah that's a theme in this book that i really love there's a lot of these characters who seem trapped in, net, in network tv or in these with these rules genji cohen later who, the creator of or- orange is the new black you talk uh, and weeds uh, involved. Was she, was she on weeds? I might be mixing that up. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Weeds and yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, that that was another example. I thought was of these people that were like ahead of their time, but working in, for networks that wouldn't let them tell the the real material that was that was true to what they were seeing and thinking and feeling. So that's that's uh, that's fascinating. I want to shift gears a bit and just talk about a bit about the reporting of this book and how you went about it, because there are some really candid conversations in here. I mean, I talk to TV executives all the time. Uh, these are people, a lot of these people have left um, uh, their companies, some of the, in some cases years ago, but there are these candid discussions of being fired, these, the toxic atmosphere, it's, uh, atmosphere at some of these companies that were producing great television. And there was, there was this one uh, that stood out to me. It was, a, I think it was an AMC executive, um, who t- uh, who talked about you know she had been fired and pushed out and she said uh, may they all rot in hell or something it was something like that and I said wow this is not the kind of quote I've seen uh, very often how did you go about finding you know who you wanted to talk to and getting people to open up to that level on the record in a book like this about TV well well you know it was hard I mean a lot of people would not open up you know um, and a lot of people did not want to. Um, talk to me about this stuff but uh, you know you just keep calling and one person leads to another it's like a daisy chain you know and if you get one you know you don't as I said I think uh, elsewhere you don't need that many I mean if you sprinkle them across a, across the book it seems like more than there are but you know somebody like you know especially if they left have they've left the business like somebody like uh, Michael Fuchs um this was his only HBO was his only job and that was already you know 30 40 years ago so he has no compunction about saying what he feels and he's very he's bitter about it still and he's angry still and that was true of a lot of people um, you know the, the woman that you're um, citing as far as AMC goes the creative executives so called at AMC hated the uh, uh, the finance guys you know that employed them and that was pretty much across the board. So um, once you know one person on AMC agreed to talk to me, then he or she would recommend somebody else. And it was, as I said, like a daisy chain. And it wasn't all that hard to get people to talk. It was amazing to see that some of this programming that that is really um, foundational now in TV history uh, was created in almost in spite of dysfunctional workplaces at several of these companies. That's the way it came across in your book. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, uh, 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 you know, the companies that, that created these sh- the, some of these shows were pretty out to lunch, but they, you know, they employed a lot of um, extremely talented people who, who actually made the shows, you know, despite, almost despite the companies they were working for. That was certainly true with AMC. It also just seems like the job of being that tastemaker in Hollywood who the kind of show picker, the person who who's, who greenlights the show and deals with the talent is is really a hard one to hold down. I mean, it looks like it, it, there's people always um you got to watch your back. Someone always thinks they can 
do it better. Why, why is that? Why is that such a fraught, uh, uh, you know, job to do in the in this business? Well, you're out there. You know, when you're picking shows, and the shows either succeed or fail. You know, it's evident to everyone. You know, and there's very little uh, tolerance for failure because the shows are so expensive to produce. You know, when uh, Chris Albrecht was um, let go at HBO, they hired four people to replace him. Uh, one, four people to replace one, and none of those people had any programming experience. So, um, programming, you know, executives with experience and who were talented at programming were extremely uh, few and, and far between. And then it, as a result of that, um, and this is a theme I've seen, this seems to be constant in Hollywood, but you really highlight it. There's this fear, uh, kind of a, a FOMO in, in, in the television business, a fear of missing out on a hit that causes, distorts people's behavior. Once you've passed on Mad Men like HBO did, or I believe on Breaking Bad, they of course didn't get House of Cards. Um, there were some other examples you had in there. Maybe it was Homeland. Um, that must do something to these people where it makes it distorts people's behavior that you don't you don't want to to miss out on things it makes you uh, it makes you say yes to things maybe you shouldn't that, well yeah i mean uh one somebody from hbo um that i spoke to, to called it schmuck insurance <laughs> right <laughs> yeah you, you would buy you would buy properties first of all, to make sure that nobody else bought them, not necessarily to produce them. And, you know, when H- you know after Albrecht left, um, the program executives went on a buying spree, and they bought practically every, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, they, they put under contract pro- practically every significant writer, uh, playwright, whatever, um, at, you know, at that, peri- at that time. And none of these things they actually produced. You know, they had a fifty, hundred, you know, at least uh, contracts, and and they prevented what what it did was they prevented all these people from uh, submitting work to other other uh, networks or their cable channels. So, and that's why they call it schmuck insurance because you didn't want to be the schmuck that what you know that didn't buy uh, Mad Men and let AMC did it, uh, develop it. How did the talent react to that? You know. Um sitting on your script for years and pretending to develop your show. Alan hated it because it tied them up and and tied their hands. You know, and uh, Mike White, who did uh, The White Lotus, uh, you know, commented on the fact that HBO had tied up a couple of his properties and uh, and he was unable to, you know, to, 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 as I said, to take them anywhere else. So we've talked we talked a lot about HBO. Basic cable also um, was in the game here in in all through the uh, uh, the aughts and through the 2010s and in producing some of these best known shows we know and love. But uh, and you talk about FX, which uh, in the early going had shows like um, The Shield and Damages, and and there have been many more. The Americans uh, later on. Uh, yes. But but they yeah. they talked there was I, there's a showrunner you talked to who just said you know this stuff was every bit as good as The Sopranos but was overlooked it wasn't didn't quite ever achieve the same you know uh, um, acclaim critically or uh, this, just the same attention for the, for those shows did you did you agree with that did you find that from more people in in that world of the kind of the the basic cable FX AMC etc world. Even, even the just anyone that wasn't HBO, basically. Well, I mean, The Sopranos kind of overshadowed everything, and a lot of people felt that um, you know, the, needless to say, those shows were as good as Sopranos, and in many cases they were. But um, you know, why The Sopranos had that over overwhelming impact uh, is a, is is a is a good question. Uh, I mean, it was definitely a wonderful show, but um, did it deserve? To overshadow everything that followed, um, probably not. I well, mean, Deadwood, for example, I thought was a great show. You know, in many ways, um, you know, better than The Sopranos. But um, you know, it was, it was killed after three seasons and didn't, it, you know, didn't begin to have that kind of impact. What is? Has, does The Sopranos sort of have a? Um, uh, 
a legacy beyond just influencing, <clears throat> you know, the idea of the anti-hero and and these and in this more um, gritty form of television. Does it have? Has it, it, it? Was David Chase the creator? Seeding kind of a generation of have you have you seen his the people who worked for him out in the rest of the business sort of fanning out and creating stuff that emanates from the sopranos what's the the scope of the impact that 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 show had yeah there was there was a kind of uh, well there was kind of hbo diaspora people leaving hbo and going to other um, cable channels and eventually streamers um, but it was also to some degree uh, true of The Sopranos. I mean, I think somewhere I'd say that all roads lead back to The Sopranos, and every, everyone, practically everyone who came after uh, uh, tipped their hat at The Sopranos uh, and acknowledged the, the influence of The Sopranos. Partly it was introducing the anti-hero, uh, which is extremely important and played a role in almost every single show that followed The Sopranos. Uh, but there are other things as well. I mean, the... the Linking of um, the the cop or the bad cop or the uh, good bad guy to the family um, and the family kitchen and sort of a normal, so semi-normal uh, 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 family story was very very important, and that was one of the things that um, David Chase did r- right off the bat. You know, these shows were also really expensive, and you mentioned the tensions between the creatives and the financial types earlier. Um, I was just thinking, you know, in in, in streaming, uh, uh, Netflix was allowed to buy Wall Street to spend a lot of money on shows, it, partially because there was a buy-in to its, uh, to its whole model. It sort of was treated like a tech company. You don't even need to make profit. You can borrow money, spend tons of money, and it's all part of sort of the business case of Netflix. But what's interesting is that these cable companies, even by 2014 or 15, people were cutting the cable cord. Smart cable executives knew that this really lucrative industry that had been so lucrative for decades was sort of plateauing or starting to be in decline. And I'm struck by, despite that, there was a real arms race. People are throwing money at shows. You know, it goes from $2 million an episode to $5 million, to $10 million, to $12 million an episode for a show. Why was nobody cautious, like none of these people cautious about maybe maybe this doesn't make sense, maybe this is irrational? Well, I think that, you know, there was just a lot of, you know, uh, there was a lot of excitement around cable. And, uh, I th- you know, and then consequently there was a lot of competition. And one of the ways you win competitions is by throwing money. Uh, and uh, it was a little bit, I guess this is a period before the big tech companies like Apple and Amazon entered the um, streaming space, which threw everything out of whack. But um, I think it was partly just the, the fierceness of the competition between uh, among the various cable networks. Uh, initially, uh, one of the appeals of um, Mad Men was that it was relatively inexpensive. But uh, as you know, one show followed another, they became more and more expensive. And uh, eventually Netflix just blew everything out of the water. Yeah, and well, when Netflix, of of course, that's when they sort of got into the originals game. Before Netflix did that, as you document here, uh, it was basically buying people's old shows in the early going and you know, moving from being a DVD provider to a streaming of old shows and movies provider. And Hollywood... All these companies were more than happy to to sell their programming to Netflix, as you show. And you talked about AMC. Um, a really classic example of this was was licensing. Uh, uh, I think it was one of the final seasons, or maybe the last season of Breaking Bad, to to Netflix, and it it resulted in this huge ratings increase for, of people watching the show on AMC. So they watched it on Netflix, and they went back. And at the time, the CEO of AMC, Josh Sapan, sort of was probably the leading guy to say Netflix is really can help us. Um, that obviously didn't turn out to be the case. What, what did you notice from talking to all these executives? What level of regret was there for kind of feeding the Netflix beast the way that they did, including AMC? 
Well, I don't know that there was, a, I mean, it's so far in the past, I don't know that there was actually a level of regret. I mean, there was, there was certainly people at the time, um, like Albrecht, who, became, who went to uh, STARS, uh, who was extremely reluctant to, uh, uh, to uh, license his shows for, uh, to, to uh, Netflix for, precisely for that reason. And, you know, uh, Jeff Bukas, who was head of HBO and Warner Brothers, famously remarked that uh, called the called the uh, streamers the Albanian army, not to be afraid of them. They weren't going to go anywhere. They didn't amount to anything. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of dismissal, a dismissive attitude towards the streamers when they started. And I don't think people really understood. In fact, one of the things that amazed me was that uh, there was a plan at one point for HBO to buy Netflix and uh, uh, Bucus, ne- you know, Bucus never did for I think two billion dollars, something like that. And Bucus never did it uh, for a variety of reasons. But at one point, uh, Reed Hastings, who who uh, founded Netflix, was asked whether he would have sold it to HBO for that amount of money, and he said yes. So you might have had a universe where HBO ain't net, ain't, uh, owned Netflix. Never would have, never happened. So it's interesting to explore the sort of what ifs. You yeah, know, in, the, al- the alternate universe. I think Comcast probably had a chance. HBO had a chance. And uh, you're mentioning Jeff Bukas, the CEO of Time Warner, at the time. I don't know if he'll if he'll ever live down the Al- Albanian army quote, <laughs> which was a really famous one. Um, and, sort, of like, yeah. sort of like Reed Hastings will never leave, live down. My only competition is sleep. Is sleep. That's yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's got real competition. Uh, real competition now. Um, well, any any account of of uh, peak TV, prestige TV, would not be complete without uh, talking about Game of Thrones. This you you highlighted here um, that it really was kind of a mess at the beginning talk about i mean this this show um, really like almost might not have happened and and it was uh there were some some things that were going badly wrong when it first uh started coming together just talk, talk a little bit about that show and and how it got off the ground well uh benioff and weiss who are the uh showrunners the writers and the showrunners on on game of thrones neither of them had any experience in tv whatsoever and in fact <laughs> You know, they, um, you know, years later after Game of Thrones had, become, had been the, become this amazing hit, uh, they came back and described their um, first uh, encounter with HBO and admitted that they had lo- lied to Richard Plepler, who was ahead of HBO at the time, telling him that, uh, you know, because the show had, well, there were a couple of reasons why it, it was a, a misfit or, for HBO. One of them, was that it was a genre show. Uh, secondly, it was a fantasy. Uh, and Plepler is, said to, is, said, is reported to have said something like, what are we, the sci-fi channel? Because they were already running the vampire show, the um, uh, name of which escapes me at the moment. Uh, uh, and, and so Game of, Thrones, and Game of Thrones also was a, was a bank, uh, you know, was going to bust the bank because it had, you know, it was, it was, going to be shot in three countries it was going to be have you know massive battles and Benioff and Weiss told uh, Plepler that all these battles were going to be off camera and they were going to you know so they were not going to cost um, they're not going to cost uh, HBO anything and they downplayed the fantasy element because they didn't want to just get fantasy nerds uh, to watch it they wanted to get all sorts of people a broader audience so um, they were not entirely frank with um, with Plepler when they uh, when they sold uh, Game of Thrones to uh, to HBO. Uh, they did a lot. They ultimately did a lot of things that they said they weren't going to do. And then the, the, because they had no experience, the first the, the pilot was the first version of the pilot was awful, and you know everybody agreed on that, including uh, Benioff and Weiss and. They had to reshoot it, and the difference between the second version and the first version was dramatic. And that's what you know. Everybody, nobody could believe that they had rescued such a horrible pilot and made a hit out of it. And it seems like they all kind of figured out that a show that was um, 
kind of have the battles off camera was going to feel a bit small <laughs> and not yeah. and not and not work and so they were willing to put put a lot of money in to do that eventually well initially people said you know the 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 first pilot was so um limited uh that somebody said they could have shot it in burbank was in where whereas in fact they right. shot it in two or three different countries so as somebody said as the uh cinematographer said uh they hadn't succeeded in translating what was on the page onto the screen. That was the big problem. And so when they when they sent it back for a second pilot or a redo of the pilot, that's what they emphasized. They they made it much more dramatic, much more scenic, much more visual. Well, why do you suppose you've seen a lot of TV and what works and what shows have clicked? And no one ever really knows why. But why do you suppose a show that do- that is heavy on fantasy and hard to pronounce names and you've got to really pay attention if you want to know which there's so many characters and storylines it's it's actually hard to keep track of why do you suppose it reached you know the ratings suggest it, it reached a pretty broad audience not you know it wasn't like a niche group of people that just were super passionate so what do you think clicked to give it that reach well i think it you know it uh it well, first of all, initially, it didn't have that. Got bad. Re- the first couple of episodes got terrible reviews in the in the press, so it took a while for them to, to you know to sort of hit their stride. But I think you know ultimately because it dealt with human themes, even though the even though it was a fantasy, so it dealt it dealt with power. You know when uh, Benny Uff and Wise were selling it to Plepler. They sold it as a show about a political show about power, and they said something like, "You, you know, after a couple of episodes, you forget where you are. You know, you could be in Paris or London or whatever." And it was all about, um, you know, uh, universal human themes, and I think that's true. And you know, it's us versus them, which is a you know a classic theme in in, in science fiction. And in a lot of other you know genres as well, you know, with the White Walkers, you know, threatening to invade from the north and all that sort of stuff, and and the um, kind of promiscuous relationship within uh, some of the families in the show was, you know, again uh, uh, offered a way in to, to offered a way into a whole a, a very wide audience. Peter, are you a um... Do you happen to be a Taylor Swift fan, a Swifty? Well, I'm not actually, not, not because I don't like her, but just because I've never seen it and uh, okay. I've never seen it perform. And um, the uh, the documentary on the sh- uh, the documentary uh, concert show is just coming to the local theater around where I live, and I'm definitely planning to see it. Well, you'll hear probably a song called "Antihero," uh, and there's a line in it. I'll read to you. It must be exhausting always rooting for the anti-hero. And I always, th- whenever I hear that, I always think about television. I said, it's been two decades of rooting for the anti-hero. Do you think audiences are ready for, uh, and maybe Apple's Ted Lasso is evidence of this, but to, to rooting for just a nice guy who is the hero as opposed to the anti-hero? Have we done too much of it at this point? Well, I think it's an interesting question because one of the reviews of my, of my book um, was called How Ted Lasso Killed Tony Soprano, um, which pretty much, I guess, right. sums up the book. And I think there's definitely a, a move away from the anti-hero. I don't know if it's because people have gotten tired of him or just because um, things in the real world, you know, uh, classically entertainment, you know, not only movies and TV, but before that, you know, novels and other forms of entertainment, theater, have been looked at as escapism, where you and you get away from the uh, enabling people to get away from the, uh, the the horrors of the real world, and those horrors have become more and more pronounced. So, uh, I think that there's a uh, definitely a, a move to away from antiheroes, also because, um, uh, well, I just think people, you know, to some degree, I guess people have gotten tired of them, but. Um, uh, you know, even um, Vince Gilligan, who did um, uh, Breaking Bad, which has a you know uh, the, the one of the most the ultimate vicious, antihero, yeah, ultimate antiheroes is doing another show 
for Apple now and says he's finished with antiheroes. So uh, I think that's definitely true. But I think there, I don't know if it's there, people are getting tired of them or there are other reasons they're long, longing for escapism, um, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows? I mean, these things come in cycles. So it's not surprising that, the, you know, the wheel is turned to some degree on antiheroes. Yeah, well, that make, that makes sense. It would be Apple. Um, Apple. Uh, Tim Cook, the CEO, has had an interesting uh, philosophy on programming. You got into it a little bit in the book, um, where he's uh, kind of wanted a bit more family-friendly approach to it, less nudity, less foul language. I don't. Know, is that still the case, is, or or is that is that something that you think is um, that was just there? their entry point in, uh, into all this, but then once they got into Hollywood, realized, well, we're just going to have to make the kind of shows everyone makes? Or, or is it like, are there Apple values that are in TV? I think there are Apple values. I, you know, they just apparently uh, let uh, Jon Stewart's show go because he was um, uh, bringing up uh, sensitive subjects like China. China is yeah. a big manufacturer of iPhones uh, and you know Apple didn't want him um, you know trashing China on his show or AI he was you know and then there was apparently a uh, new Sofia Coppola uh, uh, show that where the uh, an adaptation of an Edith Wharton novel where the uh, heroine the main female character was unlikable and they dropped that as well so I don't think it's in the past at all. I think Apple is still doing that. You know, one of the int- we're talking about Apple and uh, tech companies in general now, obviously, are big players, not just Apple, but Amazon and you know, Netflix was in its own lane, I guess. But you've got these companies. What I always hear from executives in Hollywood is that this frustration that they're really in a different business than us, and we're all judged for. You know, the same in the same way in terms of our programming and how we do our jobs, but Apple is basically in the devices and hardware business. Um, Amazon is shipping us stuff, and and television is more or less an afterthought for that for their huge core business. Um, do you think that the the tech tech companies' involvement in entertainment in Hollywood is this a flirtation or is this a permanent thing? I think it's a permanent thing because Apple has, you know, has transformed itself into from a hardware company into a service company through all these things like Apple Music, Apple TV, uh, Apple Arcade, you know, and apparently the uh, profit margins for service are much higher than they are for hardware. So for that reason alone, I, you know, as and it's all about money. Let's re, let's face it. Uh, for that reason alone, um, I think Apple is uh, is in this for the long haul, and uh, and it's not about to rock the boat. Um, uh, so you know, so uh, you know, I don't I don't think Amazon and Apple are going anywhere quickly. And the the other effect of I think of these big of these big tech companies coming into the streaming space is they just dump money on these shows. At least they have in the past. Now they may be cutting back now, but uh, they dump money on these shows. And what you know, uh, money is a double-edged sword. It makes the shows it can attract better talent and better writing, better direction, better show running, better acting, better actors by paying them more. But it also means that since um, you know Apple and Amazon want to return on their investment. That it makes the shows risk averse, and you know you see that in uh, in this you know in Disney Disney with the superhero f- uh, phenomenon where these superheroes are extremely valuable intellectual property, and they, none of them ever die. They all just if one of them dies in one universe, they pop up in another. So uh, you know money alone, which is what these. Um, uh, tech companies have to offer as i said as a double-edged sword yeah i mean it's money doesn't it doesn't translate into create creativity necessarily and 
Um, you started out by talking about how you know there was a refuge for creatives to television to this medium because of what was going on in film with the superhero um, uh, um, overload. How do you assess the state of creativity now in Hollywood, including in TV? Is it are the good ideas being made, um, or is it, it has that kind of lowest common denominator uh, thing that you talked about in film? Is that now come to to television and? And streaming, where all this IP is now being exploited there as well. Well, I think first of all, it's hard to tell because uh, I think right now I'm finding it hard to find things to watch. But part of that is the after effects of the uh, pandemic and the strike, and the fact that nothing was being made for right. know, so, uh, such a lengthy period of time. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that the um, extreme competition among the streamers with each streamer trying to reach the largest possible audience and you know coupled with the fact that um, streaming the streaming model doesn't the streaming model doesn't seem to be as uh, profitable as um, people thought it was going to be to begin with uh, has the result of that is the uh, distinctions between um, streaming and um, the old networks are breaking down. So, uh, uh, you know, the way you reach the biggest possible audience is by, is by not offending anyone and being as bland as possible. And that's what I think a lot of the streamers are, are reaching for now, unfortunately. You quoted an executive um, saying that Netflix is, is kind of becoming like CBS. I think that was the comparison. Or maybe it was either Netflix or HBO, but it was a, c- a comparison that was apt uh, stood out to me like at a certain point when you reach a certain scale you as you're saying is it just by necessity you're going to have to make very broad appealing content otherwise what, how are you serving these 230 million odd people um, is that fundamentally in tension with doing the kind of um, really provocative programming that a lot of your book is about well Netflix is pretty much abandoned abandoned it. I mean, you know, at the beginning, as I think I said, HBO wouldn't hire anybody who had worked on uh, for the networks. Uh, whereas now, and that was true of that was true of Netflix. That was true of Netflix as well. Um, and now they're sort of hiring people from the studios, from the networks, to work at at, at Netflix. Not because, not in spite of their studio or network values, but because of them. So I think that the, you know the whole uh, model is changing, and not for the good. I think it's a. The other thing is that you know Netflix, because Netflix has not been as profitable. None of the streamers have been as profitable as, as people thought they were going to be. They're changing. They're changing the model. So they're they're in the inaugurating. Um, advertising driven tiers which are about half as expensive as ad free tiers and i think once you let advertisers in in the door they're they're going to try to impose the same uh limitations on programming as they impose uh, imposed on the networks uh so that seems to me a, a really a, you know a danger a danger sign you think it's going to make the ad, having ads on streaming services is just inherently going to make people more these programmers a lot more cautious and yes, exactly, exactly. That's sobering. I mean, you know, and with networks, they just didn't want to be, you know, advertisers. Sort of, you know, from their point of view, you know, uh, justifiably didn't want to be adjacent to scenes of, you know that we're going to turn people off and I think the same is true are going to be true of streaming why should it be any different yeah it's uh, it's early days and the, the ad the ad services are still growing and but but it, it is that's a good point and something to look out for do I you think, I think Netflix has 15 million people signed up on its ad, ad uh, on its ad supported tier. Yeah, and it's Disney is trying really hard to get people to sign up for ad-supported um, Hulu, for example. If you try to buy the ad-free one, it's now like eighteen dollars a month. So they re- they really want people to to be watching ads. So I yeah. think you will see uh, you will see a lot a lot more ads and st- a lot more people will be getting those services. 
I mean, that, uh, Netflix is back backtracking on everything that made it Netflix. I mean, not only have they introduced ads, but they've stopped uh, binge, they introduced binging, and now they've they've uh, ended it essentially because it's too expensive. You know, you can't drop; they can't afford to drop a hundred million dollar or two hundred million dollar series in one one day. Um, do the, do so, the talent like the the binging model? I, I, or I'm, I'm sure it's not monolithic, but but you know, Ted Sarandos, the Netflix now co CEO, is was pretty religious on that. Like, you know, we want to do do this the way that you would binge on a DVD. It's the same thing, and it kind of makes sense. I, I recall once having a conversation with Genji Cohen, um, the Orange is the New Black creator, who who recalled they put out a season. And then she was in the airport like five days later, and someone said, "When's the next season coming?" It's like I I just finished this season, and a, you know, it must be a tremendous amount of pressure too on the talent when people can consume your show in a weekend. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know how the talent felt. I think every, you know, I think if people had probably mixed feelings about it, but you know, I certainly know that talent's a little ambivalent about streaming in general because you know I interviewed. Uh, Robert and Michelle King, you know, who did um, The Good Wife on uh, on, on, on CBS, uh, but they've also done a lot of uh, streaming shows. And their point, their position is that streaming allows too much freedom. You know, and a lot of these um, streaming shows feel padded and go on, you know, more episodes than there should be. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Did they still relish the freedom? They had done The Good Wife on CBS, and then The Good Fight was on on streaming. Correct? Yeah, uh, I think uh, they, I think they still relish the freedom of, um, of of streaming, even though they they're critical of it at the same time. Right. They were able to do storylines on during Trump that were, or on China. I recall that were that were pretty that that seemed like they'd be a stretch to put on. Um, to put on network, so but I but I I do hear what you're saying that there's maybe there's a the, the routine and the strictures and discipline of of you're going to do your t- you know 22 minutes of content or 40 or whatever and this many episodes maybe when you take that away it's not necessarily good creatively people can can go in directions that they shouldn't or it just becomes un, uh, unwieldy. Undisciplined, you know, yeah. um, just filling out filling out a season because they, it, they have to. Um, there was a, a there was a show recently canceled on on HBO called Winning Time. Um, I care deeply about this as a Boston Celtics fan, but it's a it, is a it's a show uh, about the the Lakers um, dynasty uh, of the eighties, and it was I think considered. You know, it was sort of considered one of the bigger bets HBO was making. It's on HBO, and uh, and it was people were a bit surprised when it was canceled, and a lot of fans were upset that it was canceled after uh, two seasons. Um, and I was just wondering, is that the kind of show that, because of the cost pressures of the industry now and then this new era of you know wondering if streaming is as good a business as everyone thought and all of that. Is this a show that gets canceled now, but maybe wouldn't have ten years ago? That this was the sort of thing that you would just keep keep doing for five seasons if it was twenty, you know, sixteen or something. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how much that show costs, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not a mind reader. You know, you know, H, you know, David Zaslav, who who now uh, owns runs the company that owns HBO. Has gotten a lot of flack lately for uh, ruining HBO. Uh, and first of all, he changed the name to first to HBO Max and then just Max. And now, uh, you know, HBO used to be the you know the prestige channel, um, uh, the first place any any creative person would go to get uh, financing for their shows. And now, you know, uh, some of those shows are still on the air. And Casey Bloys, who's um, been at HBO for years and is extremely talented at, at, at programming is still there but um, you also have you know you you tune into HBO and you also will see you know discovery shows like these reality Mr. Pimple Popper and shows like that so uh, 
there's been a lot of outrage at, at Zaslav for what he's done to HBO. So um, that's not really I'm not really answering your question, but so I don't know the answer. But um, but um, HBO has changed for the worse, probably you know, over over the last couple of years. It's it's interesting because they HBO is probably we've been through this period of mergers and big mergers in the industry. Um, for the past, say, decade, and HBO has been involved in a couple of them, changing hands once. It was owned by the phone company, AT&T, then now, as you mentioned, it's part of Warner Brothers' Discovery. It's merged with Discovery. Um, The brand itself has sort of changed. It's gone through all these different iterations. It's now part of this Mac streaming service. Does the brand still exist to you? Like, Like, the people you talk to, is there still a clear... You know, this is an HBO show versus this is a Mac show. Um, Do people understand that difference? I don't know. I mean, I think it brand is 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 less and I mean is less and is diminishing because you know H you know H, Max. If you go to Max, I mean, there are HBO shows within Max that say HBO, um, but there's also all this other stuff. So I'm inevitably the the brand is going to be diminished. I don't think there's any question about it. You, you, I mean, you, know, you know, you can't. You go to HBO and there's no longer, or you go to Max and there's no longer a guarantee of quality. Put it that way. There's just a lot of other stuff, just not high quality. You've seen a lot uh, of of different corporate strategies and tactics. I'm sure over the years from covering this, one of the things that I've noticed. Um, under you mentioned David Zaslav, the, the CEO of, of Warner Brothers Discovery, he he's been using this tactic of not not just canceling shows, but actually removing removing shows from streaming services or n- not releasing completely produced pieces of content like a movie. Uh, is that new? Was that is that really new? And is that how is that landed? I guess in the world of of Hollywood, <laughs> because it, I, I, does it have a does it have any um, cost or price with with talent to do that? Because it, to me, it seems pretty shocking when you make a whole thing and then you you never release it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> talent doesn't like that. I mean, they they had a fully finished show called Batgirl. I think it cost something like ninety million dollars or something, and they just uh, used it as a tax write off. First of all. Um, uh, Zaslav took on Discovery took on all this debt, forty five billion dollars, fifty billion dollars, or fifty five billion dollars, when they bought, um, uh, you know, when they combined with uh, HBO and Warner Brothers, um, and he had, he's trying to reduce this debt. So he's using some of these shows. He's not releasing, re- not releasing, or not airing already made shows, completed shows, and using them as tax write offs. And uh, the talent is like completely freaked out, and he's gotten a lot of criticism for it. And um, uh, it, and it's not a good look. The optics are, as they say, are bad for the, you know for for Zaslav and for HBO and for um, Discovery. You know, there's nothing worse than you know. I mean, you know, killing using a show as a tax. I mean, as a tax write off is uh, you know as a, as a horrible. Uh, um, uh, whatever you know it's just unbelievable well one more really quick one uh peter do you think streaming all this really is going to be resolved the streaming if streaming works as a business do you think that's going to happen do you think we're going to see streaming click as a really good profitable business well i think probably uh i'm guessing yes because these uh these uh ad supported tiers are going to get very popular so I think, and people, you know, people like streaming because it gives you, it frees you from the network schedule or the cable schedule. You can watch every, anything you want whenever you want to watch it on your own time, your own schedule, make your own schedule. So it's incredibly, uh, uh, especially since uh, the studios and a lot of these companies that own both studios and streaming are releasing films in theaters and streaming services it sometimes at once at the same time or sometimes streaming a few weeks later so like scorsese's uh, uh killers of the flower moon is, is going to appear shortly on apple so people you know it's so convenient for people instead of negotiating traffic and going downtown 
paying for parking, you know, a whole expensive theater tickets. They just sit at home and watch it on streaming, and I don't think you're going to replace that. But um, I think the uh, uh, the whole the whole model. So I think streaming is not going to go away, but the whole model is going to change, and it's not going to be the uh, bonanza that we thought it would be. Well, Peter, uh, fascinating book, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you are interested in podcasts about nonfiction books, listen to C-SPAN's Book Notes Plus podcast for interviews with authors and historians hosted by Brian Lamb.